Please stand as you are able. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, mighty and immortal, you know that as fragile creatures surrounded by great dangers, we cannot by ourselves stand upright. Give us strength of mind and body, so that even when we suffer because of human sin, we may rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. reading from the book of Isaiah. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, 
if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take the light in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Hebrews. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire in darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words make the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refuse the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I shall shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able. Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, but not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on this Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Please 
Please pray with me. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our tradition and our imagination. Amen. Well, earlier this week, I saw a post on social media, and it was one of those posts that resonated really deeply within my soul. It was of the variety where you read it and initially laugh at the humor, and then the laughter sort of turns to wincing because you notice that there is an element of uncomfortable truth behind the humor, and it cuts just a little bit too deep. The post in question was shared in a group that I'm in full of pastors, deacons, and seminary students in the ELCA all between the ages of 20 and 39. And the post went something like this. Pastors go into their first call thinking that they're going to change the world, but almost get fired for thinking they can change the bulletin. Yes, it's a humorous, little tongue-in-cheek observance of how churches, Lutheran churches, ELCA Lutheran churches especially, tend to be resistant to change. But like I said, there is an element of truth behind the humor. In the comments of this post, there were hundreds of pastors and deacons recounting stories of reasons why they were fired, nearly fired, or why folks left their congregation. The reasons that were given ranged from printing the phrase, love your neighbor, on church promotional material because it was deemed too political of a statement. The Gospels might be an issue for the people who took uh, issue with that phrase. There another reason that was given was switching coffee brands from Maxwell House to Fair Trade. Far be it from me to do something that drastic while I am serving during this sabbatical summer. There were some remarkably petty reasons shared within that thread, but the vast majority of stories that I found while I read through them could be boiled down to a single phrase or idea, but we've always done it this way. By no means is this a recent phenomenon. I have the privilege of having grown up as the child of an ELCA pastor and an ELCA youth leader who later became a pastor, so I was doing double time as a PK. And I heard many stories from the congregations my parents worked in of people growing increasingly upset because my parents had attempted to do something a little bit different than how it had been done in the past. To be fair, tradition is one of the central pillars of our faith, and we would not be the community of believers that we are today if we just up and got rid of everything every every, uh, few years or so because we deemed them to be a bit too dated. But I do think there is something to be said for discerning when doing something a different way, a new imaginative way, might be relevant given the context at hand. And as our scripture readings from today point out, we are not the first and nor will we likely be the last group of people to struggle with doing things differently than how they had been done. Indeed, all of the readings from today work in a sort of three-act narrative throughout the centuries of the Old Testament through the letter to the Hebrews. First, the Old Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, a section specifically from a period of time when Israel was returning back to Jerusalem after years of living in Babylonian exile. The passage serves as a reminder of how people are to live faithfully. It's a reminder of who they are and how God has called them to live in a community with themselves and in community with the divine as well. According to the prophet Isaiah, the people are to offer food to the hungry. They're to care for the needy. And when they do these things, they shall be prosperous and filled with joy. They're also reminded to observe the Sabbath day, one of the original Ten Commandments that were brought down from Mount Sinai, utilizing it to both rest themselves and to honor the way that God rested when God created all things. 
Specifically, Isaiah writes, if you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. Thus ends act one of our three act scene here. We have successfully set the stage with the precedent for observing the Sabbath as a way of building cohesive community with each other and with God. And the Sabbath indeed is an important custom for the Israelites as a means of grounding themselves in their own reality, especially after years of being exiled from their homeland. So then we have Act 2, which does not come from the second reading, but it does come from the Gospel, which took place before the letter to the Hebrews. Jesus is in a synagogue on the Sabbath day, the day where no work was to be done, and a crowd of people were there listening to him teach, including a woman who had been living with a crippled back for 18 years. Jesus heals this woman, much to the chagrin of the religious leaders. They admonish him for doing work on the Sabbath, breaking this sacred law, and yet he responds incredibly tactfully by calling them hypocrites. Because he knows that they do not keep the Sabbath perfectly, sometimes they will do something that could be considered work or pursuing their own interests on this holy day. And so his argument is, what reason is there to keep this woman in her condition when she had approached Jesus seeking healing other than, well, this is just how it's supposed to be done. We've never done it this way. Jesus' response is pointed and direct, but I think it's also an invitation. An invitation to expand how we perceive the world and how we show up and act within it. Are we living simply according to a rote list of ways that are just how it's always been done? Or are we seeing and connecting with the needs of those around us? Are we rising to whatever occasion might be in front of us and working to meet those needs? Jesus never advocated for the complete eradication of Sabbath observance, but was showing that sometimes the needs of your neighbors should take precedence and priority. Sometimes breaking with tradition ends up being the more faithful and loving action. Which brings us to Act 3 of our three-part saga, the section that we read from the letter to the Hebrews. There's a lot going on in this letter, but specifically I want to focus on verses 22 through 27, which touch on the fact that Jesus did things beyond the scope of accepted norms and reminds the hearers of this letter that Jesus instituted a new covenant a new set of laws, a new set of ways of showing up in this world grounded in the blood of Jesus. We remember this every Sunday when we gather at the table and celebrate the sacrament of communion with one another. This new covenant is Christ's blood shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sins. There are no constraints or boundaries placed upon who has access to this covenant of love that Christ instituted. And this in itself was a massive break from the way things had been done. Because the customs and laws that Jesus was taught growing up set the Jewish people apart. It marked them as God's chosen ones. So to make a new covenant where there are no such boundaries, there are no distinctions or barriers, is a radical break from centuries-old traditions. But Jesus was not the first to break the mold and do things in a new way. 
In fact, I am of the opinion that if we go all the way back to the very beginning of our sacred scriptures, we find that God has always been about creativity and the shifting of things. The creation narrative from Genesis, the story of how all things came into being through God, is founded upon the breath and wind of a creating and creative spirit. Because the very first thing God does in Scripture is to look upon this formless and chaotic void and breathe the Holy Spirit over it. And this world that we live in today was created out of the chaos that the Spirit calmed. The Spirit set into motion a world that can shift and flow and grow. The world was not made rigid and final and complete, but it was made into a miraculous collection of relational possibilities. And Jesus gave the gift of that very same creative spirit to all of humanity at the moment of Pentecost and through the baptismal waters. So grounding us in the tradition as old as creation itself, we create, we imagine, and we make things that take on lives of their own because we are filled with the spirit of creation. Even within our denominational tradition of Lutheranism, we are founded upon the very act of challenging the way things had been done. Martin Luther and the other leaders of the Reformation set a precedent of the church institution not being intrinsically bound to the way things were. It's not free from scrutiny and reorganization. And the phrase semper reformanda always be reforming arose from this movement and we repeat it now 500 and some years later. These days I believe that we as a church, as a global body of believers, are yet again being called by the creative spirit into a moment of discernment and imagination. A moment where the sacred duty that we are tasked with is to look beyond the way it's always been done to find where the Spirit is pulling us into more expansive, more imaginative, and more Christ-centered work in an ever-shifting modern era. And there are whispers of this movement of discernment taking place even now within the ELCA. Two weeks ago, the churchwide assembly that meets every three years to vote on resolutions and memorials and other bureaucratic words that I don't know the full meaning of because I didn't pay attention that day in seminary, met to decide where the direction the church would be headed in the future. And one of the higher profile resolutions that were voted on by the members who attended the assembly was a memorial to begin the process of reconstituting the ELCA. In recognition of the fact that this national body of a church was first constituted 35 years ago and that the world looked and felt and sounded much different back then. The assembly voted to form a committee to examine and review the current constitution of the church and in three years from now present their findings on what could and should be changed in a new possible constituting assembly. They answered the call to examine how we have been doing things and how the spirit might be calling us to do things differently. Standing in the tradition of Jesus who broke the Sabbath law to meet the needs of those who followed him and his teachings, and the tradition of the reformers of the medieval age who questioned the practices of the church at the time, I am encouraged by how this most recent assembly of our church rose to the occasion to do the difficult work of self-examination and see how we might reimagine ourselves to better serve a rapidly changing world. It is both joyous and, yes, unsettling to do things in new and different ways. 
but my prayer is that we might find comfort and promise from the thousands of faithful individuals who have come before us and who have attempted new things, not least among them Jesus, whose new covenant gives us new life every day that we rise. As this world continues to ebb and flow, to shift and start in mysterious and unsettling ways, may we hold fast to our life-giving traditions, yes, and may we also know that we stand in the tradition of discerning our neighbor's needs, of breaking norms when the situation calls for it, and acting creatively and imaginatively. So may we, as followers of Christ, filled with the creative spirit, change alongside this growing world so that the love of God might remain a constant force in whatever reality is coming next. In the name of the one who creates, redeems, and sustains us all. Amen.
Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. You crown your church with steadfast love and mercy. Guide us continually in your baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Use our diverse gifts in service to the whole people of God. We pray for our siblings in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You satisfy the needs of all creatures, protect the habitats of fish and birds, repair ecosystems damaged by misuse, neglect, or natural disaster, that all creation may thrive. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make your ways known to all people. Inspire the leaders and rulers of nations with your compassion and mercy. Raise up activists and community organizers to restore places affected by violence, poverty, and inequality. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You provide justice for all who are oppressed and relief to all who are afflicted. Heal those who are bent over by addiction, depression, and anxiety. Set free all who cry out under the weight of mental, emotional, or physical duress. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You call us to delight in the Sabbath Renew our bodies, minds, and spirits in this worshiping assembly. Give rest to all who lead our congregation in worship, study, and service. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. As we pass the peace, if you're in person, just a reminder to be mindful of people's social stickers. And if you're joining us on live stream, you can drop a message of peace in the chat or say peace to those who are with you in your space. Let us share this peace with one another. Well, if you are joining us for the first time this morning and would like to get connected with the ministries going on here at Wicker Park Lutheran, I invite you to complete the digital connect card with either the link that is on your live stream screen right now or the QR code that you can find in your bulletin with you right now. We'd love to thank you for joining us uh, here today to find out a bit more about you and to share some info about what is going on here at Wicker Park Lutheran Church. Speaking of what is going on, we are rounding the final corner of sabbatical summer as Pastor Jason will be returning next week. I will still be preaching and leading the service, but this is my last Sunday fully unsupervised, so I'm relishing it as I can. <laughs> and Pastor Jason will be returning next week, so make sure you come and give him a hearty welcome back after a very fruitful sabbatical summer. God's Work, Our Hands Sunday is approaching. Uh, mark your calendars if you haven't already. The 11th of September is when we will be uh, working here to, do, uh, to take all the donated items that we have received and placing them into bags to be handed out through the community. And up until that point, we are receiving those donations. So there are baskets in the end of the sanctuary back there, items such as ponchos, hand warmers, socks, gloves, mittens, and scarves, anything that will keep people safe and warm. We are receiving those donations in the back of the sanctuary. If you want some more information, you can scan that same QR code on the screen or your bulletin and select God's Work, Our Hands for more information. 
Another event that might interest you coming up this Saturday, August 27th, uh, Israel's Gifts of Hope organization, which is founded by our very own Annette and her family, uh, is doing their annual basketball tournament this Saturday at Roosevelt High School from noon until 3 p.m. Those of you here from Wicker Park are invited to attend and observe and cheer, or there's even rumors floating around that some of you are very gifted at the sport of basketball and might want to form up a team. I heard that Nora is absolutely chomping at the bit to get out there and lay it all on the court. <laughs> but if you have any questions or would like to learn some more, in, uh, more info, you can contact Annette or visit the Wicker Park e-news. In just a few moments after we receive the offering, we will be celebrating the sacrament of communion today. And as a sign of our beliefs as a congregation and as a church, we make no barriers to who has access to this meal. So come forward as you are to this table of unity, not of division. Mixed person and virtual, which is the way it has always been celebrated. If you're online and don't have something to eat or something to drink, you will have a minute to go and get something. And if you're here in person, we'll move into a time of collecting our offerings to pause, reflect on the electronic offerings that were already given during the week, knowing that what we give that God has first given us goes to support the ministries of this congregation, the church within this nation, and across the globe. We receive our offering now. Please stand as you're able. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, you we praise and glorify, you we worship and adore. You formed the earth from chaos, you molded us in your image. You blessed the Israelites and cherished them as your people. You adopted us as your own through the life and death of Jesus. In the night in which Christ was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread <laughs> and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy God, send upon this meal your motherly spirit, whose breath revives us for life and whose fire rouses us to love. Enfold all who share this holy food in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered by the Spirit's motherly care, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
as we go forth this day, go with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia. Thanks.